then, thank you, is um, we're going to play just less than the first half of, or about half the first half of um, the new documentary, which um, I co-produced with Danny Films and a, a co-producer in Cuba and an assistant producer in Cuba. Um, we were in Cuba in summer, summer uh, 2021. You'll remember that there was the uh, first national violent protest to have taken place since the revolution of 1959. And we were there when that happened. And also the surge in COVID-19 cases, um, which put, put unprecedented pressure on Cuba's public health care system. And for Cuba, it was the first surge. It was the first time their hospitals had faced uh, a sort of crisis, whereas in Britain, I know we were on about our fourth surge at that point. Um, anyway, so we were there in, in uh, P uh, peak or pandemia, the pandemic peak, um, boiling hot sun, you'll see me sweating with my mask on, very strict epidemiological rules in Cuba. Uh, can't go anywhere without your masks. And um, we did the, the, you know, we interviewed scientists, uh, environmental scientists and climate scientists, and but then social scientists and uh, law uh, graduates and um, various other people who you'll see. And we just walked around and talked to people who were in vulnerable communities already devastated by climate change. Um, yeah, so now then we had to rush back to Glasgow and uh, after doing 11 days of quarantine in a London hotel, we had to produce this documentary before COP26, which was hosted in Glasgow where I'm um, at the university. And um, the, the event took place at the university, but on the first day of COP. And we were delighted because this was not something we planned or expected, but the uh, Cuba's Minister of Science, Technology and the Environment actually attended the premiere with the whole of the Cuban delegation to COP, who were you know, in Glasgow for that reason. So um, we had an amazing reception. It's since been shown on Cuban national television. And I believe there's a channel in the US that's going to broadcast it there and it's been accepted in film festivals and so on. So um, I was having a discussion with John yesterday about whether I should do a presentation or we should put a bit of the documentary. And it's very hard for me to say, you know, just use an extract because it's very, you know, it's a, a, labor, a labor of love and it's put together very carefully and so on. So we've decided to just put in the first part of the documentary and, and then have a follow-up discussion. So the first part defines the problem. It makes it clear that climate change is not some hypothetical or future issue for Cuba. It is already creating an existential threat today for Cuba. Um, and then it, it, it introduces what is tarea vida, life task, which is the name the Cubans have given to something called the state plan for confronting climate change. Um, and that's a more or less a hundred year plan uh, that's divided into different time frames from very short term to very long term. So there'll be a bit of information about that. And um, then you know some of the interviews with people that we we came across in those who's been affected by climate change. And then we'll we'll stop halfway through as I say. Hopefully you'll be so intrigued you'll go off and watch the second half. Uh, but we can have a good discussion, I think, on the basis of that. So, John, if you're ready, you just go ahead and put the documentary on. Okay. <clears throat> oh, we're going to let somebody else in. Okay. I can't put on my Zoom, it says if I'm recording. Do, do you want me to do it? I can do it. It's just, at the moment, my internet connection seems fine. Yeah, why don't you try, try doing it? Because it looks okay. Like, well, let me, let me see. There okay. Go. There it is. Is it on the screen? Because it's not on the Zoom. Well... I'm sharing the, yeah. let's see if I can, do, 
if I can get it to, it says you can't, uh, You see that, Helen? Yeah. That's it. We produce and consume comes from nature. And nature sets limits on how much we can exploit it. Scientists are warning us about climate change and its effects are already being suffered around the world. We must change the way we treat this planet before we run out of time. I have been visiting Cuba for more than 25 years, learning about their alternative development. In Cuba, the state plans and controls production and distribution. This has played a crucial role in society's interaction with the environment. As a developing country, Cuba faces many challenges. Although Cuba's share of world CO2 emissions is less than 0.1%, its population of 11 million is disproportionately threatened by climate change. I have come to Havana to find out how vulnerable Cuba is to climate change and what is being done about it. In Cuba, the most common natural disasters are associated with the hydrometeorological phenomena. Fundamentalmente los ciclones tropicales que afectan al país en la temporada de junio o noviembre. Eh, asociado a ciclones tropicales está el fenómeno conocido como surgencia, que es la sobrelevación del nivel, del nivel del mar por efecto de los vientos, que provoca inundaciones costeras. We see the air pollution, climate change, the disappearance of forests due to deforestation, water scarcity. You know, there's like a lot of these environmental problems that are leading our planet to a point of no uh, return. In enero 2019, nos afectó a capital del país un tornado F4 que afectó cinco municipios densamente poblados y con un nivel de industrialización importante en nuestra capital. En Cuba la temperatura media ha aumentado en más de un grado Celsius, las precipitaciones han disminuido sensiblemente, ha disminuido la variación de la temperatura en varios grados en el día. Las sequías en nuestro país nos han impactado. Son eventos cíclicos, recurrentes, extensos. Tenemos ejemplo de que la sequía 2003-2005 fue una sequía muy intensa, muy extensa. Ocupó casi la totalidad del país. Se le tuvo que llevar agua en tren a una gran cantidad de población. Hoy en Cuba está ocurriendo una transición completa del clima del país. El clima actual es un clima tropical húmedo y hay un movimiento hacia un clima subhúmedo, un clima de otra característica diferente donde todos los patrones de lluvia, de disponibilidad de agua, de estado de los suelos, de temperatura, van a ser diferentes. El clima será mucho más caliente, mucho más árido, y evidentemente eso tiene una repercusión negativa sobre, sobre el medio ambiente. La elevación del nivel del mar tiene hoy efectos ya en nuestras costas y tendrá mayores efectos, estaremos perdiendo, por supuesto, superficies terrestres de nuestras zonas costeras. Eh, muchos poblados y poblaciones más de un millón de habitantes que habrá que habrá que moverlos hacia zonas más altas. It really scares me. I uh, a few days ago I talked with my sister and I almost cried because I was like, oh my god, this is something that it's going to happen really soon. Lo que podemos sufrir es tremendo. O sea, hay muchas islas que van a desaparecer. What can we do to prepare for the damaging effects of climate change? Finding solutions is now essential. Cuba has come up with a 100-year plan to protect its population and environment, known as Terea Vida. Es un plan de, de acciones que cometen todos los organismos de la Administración Central del Estado y sus instituciones para a, la adaptación y la mitigación del cambio climático en correspondencia con lo que el país requiere y en cumplimiento de los convenios internacionales con la Convención Marco, con los Acuerdos de París. Es coordinado por el SIGMA, o sea, el Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología y Medio Ambiente, que tiene papel de secretaría. Y la máxima responsable de esa secretaría es la ministra de Medio Ambiente, la 
la compañera Elba Rosa Montoña, pero adicionalmente a nivel de las máximas autoridades del gobierno se le presta una gran atención a este tema. La tarea vida es la respuesta de política a la información científica de Cuba sobre el cambio climático. Desde el 2014 aproximadamente se volvió una práctica que todos los años se llevaba a gobierno la más reciente información científica, sobre todo sobre el ascenso del nivel medio del mar, porque para Cuba, como una gran isla, un archipiélago, pero como una isla principal, todo lo que tiene que ver con la zona costera es clave. Y en el 2016, en diciembre de 2016, el presidente indicó que esa información científica la trasladaran a una plataforma política para llevar a medidas ejecutables la implementación de la solución o la paliación de esos problemas climáticos. Para Cuba es único y para el mundo no creo que haya muchos como plan de Estado. Todos los organismos del Estado cubano tenemos que dar respuestas con planes de acciones a corto, mediano, largo y muy largo plazo. ¿Por qué? Por supuesto, los cambios en los fenómenos ambientales no se perciben con un año o dos años de, de diferencia. Por eso se enmarcan cada cuatro o cinco años estos periodos para poder evaluar realmente los efectos del cambio climático ante estas afectaciones en nuestro país. Tarea Vida, si ha visto el plan de Estado, es un documento muy corto, porque es como una especie de plan sombrilla, que después se abre a los territorios y después va hasta los municipios. De hecho, hoy el peso mayor va estando en los municipios, porque el propio proceso de gobernabilidad de Cuba está transitando por una descentralización donde el municipio adquiere un papel mayor. Y entonces allí se espera que se tomen las decisiones. Existe una práctica a nivel de país que periódicamente el presidente de la República, junto con los viceministros primero, se reúnen con los científicos cubanos para chequear, para revisar el estado de programas y proyectos de prioridad nacional. Por ejemplo, hay uno dedicado a la agricultura, otro dedicado al tema del agua, y el tema del cambio climático, a través de la tarea vida, es objeto de chequeo permanente. Y periódicamente el, el presidente de la República escucha eh, los resultados que se van alcanzando en este plan de Estado, que es la tarea vida. Entonces eso tiene un seguimiento muy institucional, porque nosotros, eh, sin juzgar a nadie, pero también hemos visto planes de cambio climático que son para cumplir con los compromisos internacionales, algo que se hace bonito, se publica, se edita y se engaveta. Y Tarea Vida es un proceso vivo en Cuba y eso es una consecuencia del, del sistema que lo generó. Estas acciones involucran a todos los sectores de la sociedad cubana. De hecho, las comunidades son los actores fundamentales y con ellos todas las personas que dentro se desarrollan económica, social y políticamente. Es decir, no hay nada, no hay ningún elemento que esté aislado de este plan de Estado. Por eso, dentro de sus cinco ejes estratégicos, y sus 11 tareas, cada una involucra no solo instituciones científicas, sino a instituciones de gestión, de investigación, de educación, de cultura. Es decir, todos los sectores de la sociedad cubana están involucrados en el cumplimiento de cada una de estas acciones. Antes de entrar en la escritura específica, se dijo aquí la prioridad, como es la vida humana, hay que poner un peso muy importante en los asentamientos humanos que están más amenazados que son los que están en la zona costera. Otra prioridad clave es la seguridad alimentaria. Por tanto, la agricultura es otro renglón que tiene que estar muy representado en Tarea Vida. Y después se fue a las playas y al turismo, pero pensando sobre todo en que el turismo como fundamental fuente de ingreso de divisas para Cuba es también el mecanismo institucional para tener los recursos que demandan otras tareas. Por ejemplo, la tarea 3 tiene que ver con las playas, la tarea 5 tiene que ver con la reforestación, pero sobre todo de los manglares y la vegetación costera. La tarea 6 tiene que ver con los corales, porque de alguna forma el pensamiento de Tarea Vida es las soluciones climáticas a través de las soluciones naturales, reforzando la agenda ambiental con la agenda climática. Buena parte de los problemas en la costa, que la hace muy vulnerable, tiene que ver con la destrucción de las barreras de coral, con la destrucción de la vegetación costera, con el daño a la línea de costa. Y cuando todo eso se restituye, usted tiene una solución, ganar, ganar. Mejora la resistencia, la capacidad de resistir los impactos climáticos de la costa, pero mejora también la biodiversidad y otros aspectos de los recursos naturales del país. Land ownership and control over agriculture and extractive industries are key for implementing environmental policy. 
After the Cuban Revolution of 1959, large land holdings were nationalised and converted into state farms or redistributed to small farmers and cooperatives. A series of environmental laws were also introduced. In our country since 1959, uh, with the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, uh, the conservation of nature became a political will. In 1976, the Constitution of the Republic of Cuba was approved and it provided in its Article 27 uh, the duty of the state and the society to uh, care about the environment. Hoy se le llama Plan de Estado, pero desde muchos años eh, eh, siempre le ha dedicado una atención especial al tema del cambio climático y a los temas medioambientales. De hecho, desde Río de Janeiro, con las palabras de nuestro comandante en jefe, Fidel Castro, ya pone, de hecho, evidencia de todas las acciones y de las preocupaciones por el ser humano eh, como elemento fundamental. Una importante especie biológica está en riesgo de desaparecer por la rápida y progresiva liquidación de sus condiciones naturales de vida, el hombre. Es necesario señalar que las sociedades de consumo son las responsables fundamentales de la atroz destrucción del medio ambiente. Han envenenado los mares y ríos, han contaminado el aire, los bosques desaparecen, los desiertos se extienden. No es posible culpar de esto a los países del tercer mundo, colonias ayer, naciones explotadas y saqueadas hoy por un orden económico mundial injusto. La solución no puede ser impedir el desarrollo a los que más lo necesitan. Lo real es que todo lo que contribuya hoy al subdesarrollo y la pobreza constituye una violación flagrante de la ecología. Si se quiere salvar a la humanidad de esa autodestrucción, hay que distribuir mejor las riquezas y las tecnologías disponibles en el planeta. No más transferencias al tercer mundo de estilos de vida y hábitos de consumo que arruinan el medio ambiente. Páguese la deuda ecológica y no la deuda externa. Desaparezca el hambre y no el hombre. Mañana será demasiado tarde para hacer lo que debimos haber hecho hace mucho tiempo. Gracias. Yo creo que el principal valor del discurso estuvo en poner en un contexto socioeconómico la problemática ambiental, porque a veces todo ese, todo ese tema ambiental se ha visto desgajado de su origen en el desarrollo capitalista, de las bases de un sistema que basado en el consumo y, y desmedido y en el, los patrones inadecuados de producción y consumo trajo hasta la realidad actual. Y el análisis de Fidel, que al final es un análisis marxista, puso eso en un contexto de las relaciones socioeconómicas y de la evolución histórica. Y eso yo creo que es lo más valioso de ese discurso. Tuvo repercusiones importantes para Cuba. Cuba modificó en ese mismo año, eh, la 1992, la Constitución de la República, y en esa reforma constitucional introdujo el concepto del desarrollo sostenible. Another huge step in this environmental process uh, was the creation of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Environment. I mean, the conservation and protection of nature in our country received like a huge, a huge uh, boost with the creation of this uh, body. En el viaje de retorno de Río, se, se vino conversando sobre la necesidad de un organismo en Cuba para atender estos temas ambientales y así surgió en pleno periodo especial, el Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología y Medio Ambiente. Y Fidel, en la situación más dramática tal vez que ha tenido económicamente el país en esos años del periodo especial, apostó a reforzar la agenda ambiental del país. Another huge step in this environmental process was the creation of the Environmental Law 81. Currently, this is the main law in our country that regulates everything related to 
the Cuban environmental protection and you know, establishes the main standards and principles to control and direct and executing the environmental policy in, in Cuba. It puts boundaries and limits to the uh, activities of the transnational. The constitution in force is the constitution of 2019, uh, recently approved. This repealed the previous constitution and this constitution in its article 75 establishes the right to enjoy a healthy and balanced uh, environment as a human right. This Tarea Vida definitely is another important um, action in our country because it's the Cuban um, state plan to confront climate change. Cuba hay un sistema de protección civil instaurado desde el principio de la década del 60, a raíz del huracán Flora que provocó muchas pérdidas humanas, de vidas humanas y animales y daños a la economía. Está organizado de manera que desde el momento que hay una amenaza hay una vigilancia eh, permanente sobre el fenómeno que se, de que se trate y está establecido ya la, en, en diferentes etapas cómo son los mecanismos de protección, de evacuación. La conceptualización del, de la defensa civil de Cuba se basa en un enfoque sistémico. Tiene la función de proteger la población, sus recursos, sus medios, la economía, el medio ambiente ante diferentes tipos de eventos y peligros de origen natural, tecnológico y sanitario. Y son no solamente para situaciones de desastre, sino también para ante la guerra o ante las consecuencias del cambio climático. Estamos ubicados en la cuarta región de formación de huracanes en, en el mundo. La actividad meteorológica es bastante activa. Estamos en pleno desarrollo de la temporada ciclónica que se inició el 1 de junio y concluye el 30 de noviembre. Por lo tanto, no solo tenemos establecidos procedimientos operativos técnicos uh -huh. para la alerta temprana ante el impacto de eventos meteorológicos extremos. Uh -huh. Tenemos bien establecido las zonas de vigilancia reforzada y las zonas de máxima alerta donde le damos seguimiento al acercamiento de un evento y al probable impacto que pueda tener en nuestro país. Este sistema que está organizado a nivel nacional, hay un Consejo de Defensa Nacional que sencillamente coordina las actividades a nivel del país, se reproduce en todos los niveles, escalas del país, a nivel de provincia, a nivel de municipio, a nivel de barrio. Y por ejemplo, un detalle de este sistema es que a nivel local existen unos centros de, de estudio de los riesgos que se ponen en función del fenómeno en particular, ya a escala, a escala de municipio. Y bueno, a nivel local el barrio se organiza, el barrio se organiza, las organizaciones sociales que existen en el barrio toman la precaución, los gobiernos locales eh, se constituyen en consejos de defensa eh, locales, que lo que hacen es organizar cómo trabaja el sistema, eh, redistribuye los alimentos de una manera, se garantiza la distribución de alimentos básicos para que a las personas no les falte, se, se chequean todas las instalaciones eléctricas, se chequea el plan de evacuación y se produce una, la evacuación, ya sea la autoevacuación, hay personas que se autoevacúan a, a, a lugares más seguros de vecinos, de amigos, de familiares. Y también está determinado que esos que tienen que evacuarse a instituciones del Estado eh, porque sus viviendas estén en mal condición. Las organizaciones de políticas y de masa son parte también de ese sistema de defensa civil. Esas organizaciones de masa no, son, no es más que la componen que la población. Por lo tanto, cuando hay una situación de un evento en el país, esta, esta misma población es parte, por ejemplo, de las brigadas sanitarias que se activan en los consejos populares, en las zonas de defensa. Eh, apoyan el trabajo de los, lineares, de los linieros, que son lo, los especialistas que van a establecer los sistemas vitales relacionados con la energía. Eh, apoyan en la limpieza de, los, de, sus, de sus propios barrios, porque después de un evento se, se supone que hay una gran afectación al tema volado, edificaciones, estructuras. Uh -huh. Y todo ello son parte también de los trabajos que se realizan en los territorios. Eso garantiza varias cosas. Primero, que esté a nivel de barrio la, la protección. Y segundo, que hay un conocimiento pleno, porque son los mismos vecinos que saben exactamente eh, dónde está el, la persona más vulnerable, cuál es la edificación más, más desprotegida. Y eso da, da seguridad eh, en, este, en este proceso. Nosotros tenemos un ciclo de reducción de riesgo de desastre, que es prevención, preparativo, respuesta y recuperación. Y una recuperación que tiene dos periodos, el que rehabilita los sistemas vitales y, y la reconstrucción. 
En nuestro país se desarrolla un ejercicio anual en el mes de mayo antes que comience la temporada ciclónica, que es el ejercicio meteoro, o es el ejercicio que es ante, las acciones, eh, ante situaciones de, de desastre. Que eso en sus inicios se hizo por el tema de, de, los, de los ciclones tropicales y de los huracanes, pero ya ha ido cogiendo una connotación mucho más amplia y se incorpora la, lo que debe hacer la, la población ante la sequía, ante los sismos, es decir que ese ejercicio le da preparación a la población y la percepción de riesgo es bastante, bastante elevada y la, los fallecidos que tenemos, si cuando se hace el estudio el análisis casi siempre son por negligencia. Cuando hay problemas climáticos, enseguida la defensa civil y el gobierno se atiende al pueblo cubano y se evacúan y se prestan todas las atenciones. La Cruz Roja, la defensa civil, inclusive el ejército, los militares, todo, 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 todo. inclusive los vecinos. Hace poco teníamos un encuentro Cuba-Puerto Rico viendo los temas de, de cambio climático y veíamos en torno a los fallecidos por el huracán Irma, que en Cuba fueron 10 y en Puerto Rico fueron 3.000. Nosotros tenemos pérdida de vidas humanas también en eventos eh, meteorológicos, pero han sido mínimas, son mínimas las pérdidas. Eh, las tasas son muy bajas. Siempre se hace un análisis. Ahí está, nosotros, nosotros contamos con un procedimiento donde participan varios organismos de la Administración Central del Estado y cuando hay un fallecido hay que realizar una, una labor de investigación profunda del por qué el fallecido, cuáles fueron los motivos. Y en muchas ocasiones son negligencia de las personas. ¿Usted vive por aquí? Sí, sí. ¿Y ha tenido daño en su propia casa? Eh, la, eh, afortunadamente he sacado las cosas, las he levantado. Ah, pero sí. el agua entró sí, a su casa. Y mucho hasta, fango hasta, que deja aquí. Ay, hasta madre. el rodapié de la casa, es ahí. Sí, hasta... No, no, hasta rodapié. Ah, sí, va, okay. Pero mira, para allá sí llega hasta aquí. Sí. Hasta aquí, se, la ha, se, la ha, se les ha inundado las casas. Han perdido colchones. ¿Y, y se han destruido algunas casas, me dijeron, allá más cerca? Que sí, sí, para, para, mira, pero para allá y para allá, okay. para la parte de allá. Mira, el mar, el mar es allá, después de esa casa, sí. al fondo. Entonces podemos mar. ir allá y ir sí. caminando. Para allá es la ya. zona baja, allí sí, pero siempre se ha tomado medidas y se ha ayudado. Sí, se ha evacuado sí, la gente. Sí. Cómo no, inmediatamente, la defensa civil. En nuestro análisis en el Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología y Medio Ambiente, el tema de los asentamientos humanos amenazados eh, es considerado el más complejo de todos. Porque con independencia de la inevitabilidad de algunas medidas, siempre es traumático. No se trata de incomprensión de las personas, puede haber casos de incomprensión, sino que en cualquier situación es muy doloroso, porque implica todo un cambio de formas de vida, implica un cambio cultural, implica un cambio de tradiciones. Hacerles una pregunta. Nos dijeron que esa área Santa Fe está muy baja y entra el mar y que esas casas que vemos aquí han sido abandonadas. Como el, el lío del cambio climático, las marejas que se forman de aquí en el noroeste se han llevado, todos los muros de la orilla de la playa se han llevado y como no hay para pa, pa reparar, se va, se va desbaratando más y se va desbaratando más y se va desbaratando más. ¿Y usted vive aquí? Yo vivo ahí, yo, yo nací ahí. No, mi no. casa cuando el mar entra, quitamos las puertas de frente, y la, la puerta del fondo y la puerta de frente. Subimos todas las cosas para arriba y el agua entra por la puerta de atrás y sale por adelante como si estuvieras en el mar, como si estuvieras en, en un barco en el mar. ¿eh? El agua sale por ahí, pero bueno, si la, ha llegado a la escuela, a la secundaria que está, casi a cinco cuadras de aquí. Cuba yo creo que siempre eh, tiene consultas. Eh, no quiere decir que el 100% de la población esté de acuerdo con esa toma de decisiones, por supuesto, no es obligado, no es una represión para el que no lo haga, lo que realmente hay que evaluar esto, esta posibilidad de que el Estado cubano te está dando, de que vayas a vivir a otro, a otro lugar cercano también, porque las personas que viven del mar y que han nacido en el mar, jamás van a querer darle la espalda al mar. El problema es que el 99% de la gente que vive a la orilla del mar aquí no se quiere ir de aquí, ¿viste? Nosotros mismos, mi casa, mi casa antiguamente era de madera, de dos pisos. Ajá. El mar se, la primera vez que el mar entró, dejó la casa, la parte de arriba y la parte de abajo la dejó en la pared de frente y en la pared de atrás. Y nos, y, y nos dijeron que estaba inhabitable, pero nosotros la levantamos, después tumbamos la parte de arriba y empezamos a construir. Pero no hemos quedado parados porque los materiales están muy caros. Pues está muy caro. Y no quieren mover de no, aquí. No, nosotros aquí no nos vamos.
Esa casa se puede quedar en un bloque, que yo aquí no me voy. En un bloque. Yo me meto a los botes, son muy... ¿Y ustedes son pescadores? Pescadores, o... todos somos pescadores. El que, que, que vive a los orillas más pez, lo que hace es pescar. Hey. Que vive en el campo, vive en la tierra. Que vive a los orillas más, lo que vive es la pesca. Llegará el momento en que realmente esas casas no, no van a poder estar ellos viviendo en ellas porque quedarán inundadas. A mí simplemente no me gustaría salir de aquí porque ya es un amor que le tengo a esto. Pero bueno, Dios gracias que no nunca tenga que mudarme. Me gusta esto aquí, simplemente el barrio, los amigos y todo lo mismo. Y ya uno está acostumbrado a esto. Sí, pero en tu rato dos, mira cuántas casas abandonadas aquí. Que es muy probable que, que ustedes van a tener que también abandonar, ¿no? Sí, ya de un tiempo, quizás de aquí a un tiempo puede ser que también tengamos que irnos. Yeah, watch this shit. Ay, no sé, cualquier cosa, debido a cualquier cambio climático. En toda la parte de Santa Fe, el náutico, todo eso tiene una prioridad en todo el trabajo de adaptación al cambio climático y sobre todo de esta zona eh, pesqueras y de estas áreas donde habitan personas de toda la vida que viven ahí y que hacían uso de la costa fundamentalmente. Lo que pasa es que hoy tienen una afectación y dentro de 50 años tendrán otra afectación mayor. Todo ese proceso de reubicación de personas que residen en asentamientos que están bajo alto riesgo por su vulnerabilidad es financiado por el Estado. De hecho, es una de las complejidades para dinamizar más ese proceso porque como no es dejado a las posibilidades de, de cada ciudadano, sino que el Estado asume esa responsabilidad, requiere recursos cuantiosos que el Estado tiene que prorratear entre muchos gastos que tiene. Pero es una de las áreas priorizadas de actividad del Estado, generar esa reubicación. Se han construido nuevos asentamientos, se han construido nuevas comunidades, se han construido nuevas edificaciones en comunidades preexistentes. Una de las cosas que también nosotros hemos aprendido es que no es solamente un tema físico de reubicar viviendas, te tiene que reubicar toda una forma de vida, te tiene que reconstruir un escenario donde esas personas tienen los servicios sociales, los servicios médicos, los servicios educativos y tienen las oportunidades de trabajo. Eso se hace más complejo cuando el trabajo original en la comunidad está muy ligado eh, a la costa, como pasa en el caso de las comunidades pesqueras. Hemos ido evolucionando hacia la idea de que la reubicación de comunidades es una medida extrema que solo se aplica cuando se han agotado todas las otras medidas. Porque al final, viviendo en una isla estrecha y alargada, usted no puede resolver los problemas en la zona costera a través de la reubicación de la población. Entonces, eso hay que resolverlo con medidas sobre la costa. Y ahí es donde estamos privilegiando las soluciones naturales donde quiera que es posible. No se trata de una cuestión mecánica. Tenemos que entender esto económica también para... ...de cada ciudadano, sino que... Le... Okay, thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. So that was the first half of our documentary. Um, and uh, they go on and talk about uh, more about Terrea Vida, the state plan. And they talk about the important role of um, the way that the leading role that scientists have played in Cuba, um, not just on this issue, but on many issues and how the government actually listens to the scientists. Then they talk about the increasing role given to social scientists in this process and realizing that it's really important when you need the participation of the community and population and you want to make sure that everyone is on board, people with disabilities, um people with uh you know from all sorts of marginalized groups need to be part of the discussions about how to adapt to and mitigate climate change so they go on and talk about that and then we move on and talk about the big obstacle that cuba faces in this field as in every sector of life in cuba which is of course the united states blockade um which was you know said very clearly at the beginning But, you know, whenever, because I research a lot in Cuba and, and I've looked at different areas of development. So I've looked at medical science, I've looked at um, renewable energies, now climate change. I've looked at, you know, the more general economic issues. And whatever you look at, uh, when you go in detail, you just see the incredible obstacle created by US sanctions. So even things like um, just getting the equipment that the meteor meteorology 
institute needs to be able to detect, uh, you know, climate conditions, to be able to detect when when um, hurricanes are coming. You know, even just technical equipment is just so difficult for Cuba. And you see that across every single field. So there's a bit about that. And then also we just happened to be there when on the 17th of July, so it was six days after those protests that took place, one day of protests um, that happened in Cuba, uh, there was a, a, a rally on the Malacon. So lots of you I'm sure have been there. It's the seawall next to in Havana. Um, and Pre President Miguel Diaz Canal was there, Raul Castro was there, although I don't believe he spoke, but there was something like 200,000 Cubans who went there. Um, I knew lots of Cubans who said, I can't go because, um, you know, we've been asked not to go uh, in big numbers because of, you know, epidemiological restrictions for COVID. And it was amazing. It was the first time I think they'd been out, mobilized on the streets again, making that demand to end what they regard as the genocidal blockade of Cuba. But um, as you'll see in the documentary, like all things Cuban, it ends up with a fiesta pachanga, as they say, with a party uh, and then dancing with their, with their placards and slogans um, calling for an end to the blockade. So, and then um, we go on to the last section of the documentary, which some of you will be most interested in, which talks about the international perspective so Cuba is engaged in collaborations with its Caribbean neighbors, but it's also offering um, its information, the experience that it's gained, its science to its neighbors and the rest of the global South. And the Cubans came to COP uh, ready to share information and their experiences through Tare Vida, their state plan for confronting uh, climate change. And then the final issue is um, looking at the question of, uh, you know, can capitalist consumer societies actually tackle climate change? And, you know, and how really at the heart of this from the Cuban perspective is the challenge of uh, economic and social justice. So um, Orlando Rey, you know, says that for, for from their perspective, the only way you can have a plan like Terre Vida based on community participation, environmental science and natural solutions, which puts first the protection of the uh, of the population the environment and the economy is through a socialist system so um a few observations that i want to make very briefly on the documentary and hopefully i mean really you know i should have said from the beginning get your bits of paper out get ready to scribble questions notes it's always um, fulfilling when you've presented to have lively discussion afterwards and to know that you've provoked questions and comments so please don't sit there quietly thinking I'm not going to say that because I might sound stupid or something like that you know it's much better to get a discussion going so my observations for Cuba as I said at the beginning like many SIDS which are small island developing states particularly in the Caribbean but all over the world climate change is a crisis today not in an abstract future. In Cuba, you have the notion that the state, and I mean state in the broader sense, not just politicians, but in the sense of the scientific and educational um, policy-making institutions, the state is responsible for safeguarding the population and the environment, not depending on private profit-seeking interests. So there aren't public-private partnerships. There aren't, you know, mechanisms to try and persuade corporations to behave better or pollute less. That's not necessary in Cuba, where the state is in control of production and distribution. Um, Cuba's approach is founded in sci science. That's obviously a big deal coming out of the, the era of the Trump administration. I, uh, next point. They recognize that without grassroots popular participation, their important and ambitious plans are not achievable or sustainable. They trust in communities to comprehend, to appropriate the tasks, and to use their local knowledge to propose natural solutions. Point five is that the Cuban government and scientists are willing to share their results and benefits of their approach, with the rest of the world, as I already said. 
And the, the final point, point six, is that the Cuba, in the Cuban analysis, the roots of the environmental destruction and climate change lie in colonial and imperialist exploitation and the rapacious expansion of capitalist consumer societies. They have a critique um, about the approach of the industrialized advanced capitalist countries in their approach to solving this global problem, which threatens the future of our planet. And I would argue, and I think the documentary tries to argue that the Cubans certainly present um, an alternative that needs to be listened to. So I'll stop there and I hope you've all got lots of questions and comments. I think the way to do this would be to alternate between people on Zoom and people in the audience. So let's start with people in the audience. Anybody want to ask a question? And you have to speak up pretty loudly so Helen can hear you. We'll repeat the question that we asked. I would like to hear, I know you did a documentary on COVID, and I would like to hear um, Cuba's response and just, you know, if you could not take a big long answer, but to give us uh, the basics around COVID. Did you hear that, Helen? Yeah, sure. Shall we see if there are any other questions in the room before answering that? Bear in mind, please, people, that it's midnight here in Glasgow, so please make my staying up late worth it. You've got a question on Zoom there. John, do you want to take Andy on Andy, Zoom? Andy, go ahead. Hey, uh, Professor Yaffe. You've written brilliantly on the law of value. So... <laughs> You know, there's a fisherman in the documentary who must face pressures from the law of value. So how would you untangle this particular question? I agree with you about the state being on the side of the working people for a change. I get that. But what about the insidious character of the world economy? I need more direction. What about it? In relation to the fishermen, the law of value? I mean, come on, where are we going with this? So the question is, you know, really in terms of climate change, we're going to really trying to roll things back. Local knowledge, you know, but there's a deep rift um, that must be overcome. And I, <clears throat> I'm very, uh, enthralled with the Cuban example. But the bigger problem is this insidious penetration of the law of value. Which you, I'm, I'm quoting you, of course. I'm not making this up. I learned this all from you. Okay. Um, so shall we see if there's any more questions or shall I go ahead and answer those two? I was hoping there might be some overlap, but there's absolutely none. <laughs> Anybody else have a question in the audience? I also want to ask about what you saw. I can't hear you, so you'll have to, John, you'll have to repeat the question. like you to describe what you see and what you've experienced. Do you hear that, Helen? No. Okay, well, she asked, what about the current situation in Cuba and the destabilization efforts and so on? What did you see in relation to that? Anybody else? Okay. Anybody else with a question? Well, let, let me just, oh, okay, go on, go on. No, go ahead. Well, it was a very question. You were there in July 11th during the protest. So maybe we can talk about the destabilization. You can describe your experience. What, what caused the protest of July 11th? And how did the Cuban people and the Cuban government uh, confront it? I think the question was about the 11th of July protests. What caused them and how the government has um, confronted them or responded, yeah? 
Yes, yeah, that was that. Uh, okay. I'm going to try and be quite succinct because I can probably speak for about an hour on all of these, especially the law of value. <laughs> okay, so Cuba's response to COVID. Actually, the key features of Cuba's response to COVID are very similar to its response to climate change in very broad sense. So it puts the, the welfare, you know, people's welfare first before thought about economic growth or, or you know, anything else. Um, Cuba, Cuba responded to COVID um, by mobilizing its world leading public healthcare system. Um, now, I, you know, people in Britain, when you talk about Cuba's healthcare system, they can relate to it a bit better than you guys. But you, for you guys, it's just like mind blowing. The idea that there are more doctors per person three times more doctors per person than in the United States, but they're all free at any point to go and see them. You have one in every community, more or less every street, every long street in Cuba has a family and uh, family doctors and nurses clinic. And either the doctor and, the, or their and their family or the nurse and their family live there, which means that you can get assistance from your neighborhood doctor or nurse 24 hours a day. So um, what did they do? They immediately, um, because of sanctions, because of resource constraints on Cuba, they couldn't take the, pro uh, the, the effective approach that some countries like South Korea took, which is immediately introduced lots of testing. The Cubans struggled to get their testing going. Um, you know, you have to remember everything in Cuba is difficult. The Buying syringes on the international market became incredibly difficult because syringe production is dominated by something like six companies that all have some link to the United States or a, share a laboratory with a US subsidiary. You know, it's really cruel that the Cubans have the capacity to be the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean to have developed COVID-19 vaccines, world leading with efficacy rates of over 90%. And yet they had to rely on the international solidarity movement. And I'm sure there's lots of people here from the US who contributed to buy millions of syringes to vaccinate their own population. How cruel, what an awful juxtaposition. So, um, so Cuba used its public health capacity immediately, as soon as they had their first case, or before they had their first case, in January, when news was only just coming out in certainly in Britain, that there wasn't, you know, this new virus, they sent a team to China, they learned from the Chinese medics, they came back, they trained, they prepared all the hospitals, not just the medics, but the porters, the taxi drivers to look for symptoms, they prepared people in the airports and the docks. And this is before their first case, their first case of COVID happened and they mobilized their public healthcare service system. So they closed down the universities as happened in most countries and 28,000 medical students went to work alongside those family and doctors and nurses. And they went door to door every day, knocking on doors. Hi, how's everyone feeling? Anyone got a cough? Anyone got labored breathing? And anyone suspected they would take them to um, get tested and to be isolated. So they would immediately withdraw anyone who was potentially um, had the virus from circulation. And through this method, while their scientists began working incredibly hard with very limited resources to develop the COVID vaccines and to adapt and develop um, or adapt existing medicines that they had in the pipeline, for other viral um, infections, they developed them and adapted them for COVID uh, treatment. And they've come up with some brilliant treatments, like something called Jusvinxa, which has reduced the mortality rate for people who reach a critical state at the point when you um, get the uh, inflammatory reaction in the lungs that, that, um, that can kill people, they have a drug that reduces the fatality from something like 90% to 20%. So, I mean, the incredible things they've achieved. Meanwhile, they were using this public health care outreach to control community contagion. 
what happened is they'd done so well in 2020. As we show, we made the documentary. We finished it, you know, five hours before the premiere because we <laughs> obviously get into this habit of doing things with a very short deadline. Um, we finished it in November. By the end of the year, the, in the whole of 2020, this island of over 11 million people had had only 146 people dying um, from COVID. Okay, it was one of the, um, the lowest in the world. And they, but because of the economic situation, they had closed down tourism, which is a key earner, key source of revenue for Cuba. And then they had the, you know, that had compounded sanctions already really intensified from late 2018 by Trump. So they um, saw that the figures were low and they opened up the economy, opened up the borders in November 2020. 2020. And what you had then is a lot of Cubans who live overseas in countries with very high incidence of COVID coming back into Cuba and rates soared. And so, well, they started to climb gradually in January. And, you know, it, it was just fascinating. I left Cuba in January. When I got back to London, the mayor of London had declared an, a, a, a citywide emergency for the hospitals were in crisis. And, you know, we had one in 10 people with COVID in London at that point. And the Cubans were, were worried because they had 35 people across the island a day, not dying, but actually infected. Anyway, the numbers went up and then they were struck by, um, you know, beta variant and the Delta variant over the summer. And it hit hard and they had surges um, and there was a set of circumstances. This leads me into the question about the 11th of July there were a set of complicating circumstances. So they really prioritized public health. In a context of shortage, that means you're making decisions, or you're rationing resources. So they had, for example, made sure that the healthcare facilities were prioritized for food and electricity. And this was one of the reasons that certain areas of Havana uh, like San Antonio de los Baños, where the first violent protest started, they had suffered from electricity blackouts in the previous um, days, right? Lasting, not, not like the special period of the 1990s, lasting four or five hours, but alarming for Cubans who lived through that period of the 1990s. I was in Cuba, I experienced those blackouts that could last for 12 hours. Um, I mean, the, the backstory to this always goes back to US sanctions. And it always goes back to the difficulties that Cuba faces just in international trade, purchasing spare parts. The electricity blackout that happened in San Antonio de los Baños was a result of um, uh, failed equipment and the Cubans couldn't get spare parts. And it was also a result of not being able to get a specific kind of fuel, which they normally have from Venezuela and Venezuela is being sanctioned its oil industry has plummeted and, and faced a crisis. And the Cuban, you know, you, um, power generators are complex. They have to use a specific kind of fuel. And um, that this was all explained in great detail by the president himself, who by the way, is an electrical engineer by training, Miguel Diaz Canal. So um, you, what you had in Cuba in July was a situation where the Cubans had had COVID under control the previous year and they were losing control. Um, but this was, uh, you know, and for Cubans, it was alarming. It was really alarming. They've never seen their public health care system under strain, right? Now, we might be more used to it. And their neighbors in Latin America and the Caribbean, that is the norm. But for Cubans, they've never seen it. Um, there was a delay in rolling out the COVID, the Sobarana vaccine, which was due to be rolled out across Havana and then down into Matanzas, where the most violent protests took place. Why was there a delay? Because although it's a completely domestic vaccine, like most things, it relies on one, you know, on an input, an ingredient for the vaccine, which is uh, very controlled by a very few companies, produced by very few companies, and Cuba can't get it from 90 miles away in the United States because of sanctions. So again, it goes back to sanctions. What this meant is that there was a delay possibly for two months um, in the rollout of the vaccine, which if it had 
being rolled out when planned, a lot of the surge would not have happened. And we can be clear of that now because what's happened with Omicron, um, you have a, a more or less fully vaccinated population. Case numbers have gone up, but fatalities have stayed really low, like between zero and 10. So that shows that their vaccines are highly effective. So going back to July the 11th, you have these circumstances since 2019. I was in Cuba in 2019, and already there were goods shortages, which were the direct result of sanctions by the Trump administration. For example, in, I think it was May 2019, they suddenly declared that they were going to fine shipping companies that took oil from Venezuela to Cuba. And they were also gonna fine the companies, the insurance companies that, that insured the shipping companies and the insurance companies that insured the insurance companies. Now, they, they, those companies just stopped. They just said, look, we've got, a, we've got a, you know, a whole ship full of oil, but we can't dock in Cuba because we're not risking the fines. And so suddenly Cuba was phone, thrown once again into an energy crisis, which was externally imposed. Now, this affects, uh, you know, your ability to move agricultural products around. So stuff get, you know, you can't drive tractors because there's no oil. So stuff lies in the field and rots. And so it affects everything. It affects their ability because Cuba also um, sells on some of the oil. It affects their ability to do that. So food was hit hard. And already before the pandemic, you had long queues. Cubans that I live with, Cuba, I mean, anyone who's been to Cuba who knows Cuban families will know they've been getting up at four in the morning, five in the morning to get in queues for shops that might not open till 10 or 11 and the merchandise might not even come in. Now, why are they queuing for scarce goods? Because what the government has done is said, we will distribute fairly the goods that we have. And that means you need to get in line and wait your turn for distribution because if they just said, let's leave it to the market, people would have starved to death. Right, so that's the situation now. I mean, since I've been going to Cuba and the situation has been like that, I have avoided going to shops, right? Because I live with Cubans and they're getting up at five in the morning and doing the, the food shopping. But, you know, imagine that's you. Imagine that is before you go to work, before you do your caring, before you do your studying that day. It is exhausting. And interestingly, um, a month before those protests in June, I wrote a report about the economic situation in Cuba. And I said, the Cubans have shown incredible, unbelievable patience and resilience to this situation, but we shouldn't be surprised if there are outbursts. Because, you know, if you think about the original conception of the US blockade, there's this, I always quote it, and I'm, I'm writing an article right now about the US blockade, because obviously we've just had the 60th anniversary, right, of the full, the full pro proclamation. Um, and it's based on a, um, the objective of the blockade is very clearly, or embargo as you lot say, <laughs> is very clearly laid out in a memorandum written by a guy called Lester Mallory, Assistant Secretary of State or something or other, 1960 and he says <clears throat> the the revolution castro has too much support we, we don't have any chance of you know rallying a force in internally what we need to do is weaken the economic life of cuba to make it hard to you know with salaries and every, everything to cause hunger desperation and misery now those words are penned in a u.s government memo advising what action to be taken to deal with the Cuba problem, right? And so what we saw last summer in Cuba was a culmination of that policy. It was to some extent, extent um, a manifestation of some success finally after 60 years. The, the context of creating shortage, of creating frustration, of, um, you know, using the people who who organized that first protest by the way in san uh, antonio de los baños on the 11th of july there was one protest 
that sparked that you know got big and violent and then was filmed on Facebook and whatever and that sparked the rest right they were um not quite spontaneous I would say that protest was called by a, a group of people on a Facebook page yeah who said we they did an interview afterwards they said we knew the situation was really tough with COVID and the electricity shortage and it was hot you know because in the middle of summer believe me it was boiling so we decided to make the most of that to see if we could call people out so they're very aware you know it is an echo of that memo let's create circumstances that are unbearable in the hope that it will turn the Cuban people against their government so um, this is the other the other aspect which we we can't we mustn't talk about the 11th of July without talking about how it was also a conscious product of regime change programs which particularly since Obama in 2009 shifted towards a focus on youth and what they call marginalized communities Afro-Cuban communities uh, LGBT communities. Um, anyone you know hip hop artists or, or, or artists i should say anyone who could be somehow presented as a victim but could be used as a tool against the socialist state and 20 million dollars is approved of your taxpayers money every year every year through the us congress to what they call democracy promotion programs which are clearly regime change programs. And an increasing amount of that has gone to setting up Facebook um, campaigns, setting up YouTubers and influencers and massive you know, money spent on uh, what they call bots and trial farms. So you have people, either it's automatic or you have people who are basically paid to sit in a room and retweet. Um, and you can see it, right? So you know, even the foreign minister, uh, Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez came out with information that actually was produced by a Spanish media analyst who was pointing out that in the days before the 11th of July protest, this hashtag on Twitter was being circulated, SOS Cuba or SOS Matanzas, which was the area that they were suffering a big surge. And there were Twitter accounts that were retweeting messages every five a second. And he said to the journalist there, you try it. You see if it's physically, humanly impossible possible to do five retweets a second. So we know that there, this is this undercurrent all the time of a conscious policy to generate, uh, well, two things, the two-track policy to create suffering and, and then in order to, to generate a domestic opposition. What did I see on the 11th of July? This is really important because I left the quarantine hotel in Havana. I'd been there for five days, as I said, very strict epidemiological conditions. And I traveled across Havana and I saw nothing. I honestly knew nothing about the protests. Do you know how I found out? I got to my home where I'm staying, living in Havana, in a marginalized community in Havana, and I said to everyone, I'm not talking to anyone till I've watched the football match because England was in the final of the European Cup and it was on Cuban TV and I'm English, so there you go. And I found out about the protests because halfway through the broadcast was interrupted by the president of Cuba who told the Cuban population that there had been protests around the country. And that was when he said, you know, revolutionaries must defend the revolution and, and um, take control of the streets. And in response to that, thousands of Cubans went out, tens of thousands of Cubans went out in towns and cities around the country. And they went out to say, you're not messing with our revolution. They went out to say, we'd support socialism. We support Miguel Diaz Canal and we support the revolution. Now, what happened is, unbelievable quantities of images were taken the footage of taken of those pro pro government protesters and they were circulated as anti-government protesters you know who did this i mean everyone did it right fox news did it for 
Fox News was interviewing these um, right wing Cuban American senators, right, like Rubio and them. And they had images on the background and they had purposefully blurred out the messages on the placards. Why? Because they had pro-revolutionary uh, symbols. So the fact that they blurred them shows that they were well aware of what they were doing. Um, Michelle Bachelet, the former president of Chile, uh, she's now human rights commissioner for the UN or something like that. She tweeted a picture of a black woman holding a Cuban flag and screaming saying, oh, you know, anti-government protesters. And the woman replied, how dare you? I was out saying I stand with socialism and Miguel Diaz Canal. And you know what happened? Her account was suspended by Twitter. If any of you don't know this, images were circulated before protests happened. Images were circulated of the Arab Spring in 2011 in Egypt even though they were Egyptian flags, you know, people were just retweet, retweet, recirculate. Images were circulated of May Day two years ago with two million Cubans, uh, you know, on International Workers' Day and, it, and the claim that they were anti-government. I mean, it was just crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And it does make you think, you know, having been in Cuba um, and, and seeing the other side of it, I, you know, I went, I traveled around Cuba extensively the next day. I went from where I was across Cuba to center and so on. And there was a tense calm, but it was one day of a few hours of um, some violent protests. Some never got violent, right? And, and, and just so much mileage Cuba's critics have tried to get out of this, you know? And it doesn't, it pales into insignificance compared to what happens every day in the United States. So what has been the response? I think this is really important. In some ways it's been beneficial and healthy for the Cuban revolution, for the state and for the communities because it was a wake up call. Now they had all sorts of projects pending to improve the situation in poor neighborhoods as they call them, the barrios, yeah? In poor municipalities to spruce them up, to get local development projects, to get people who are unemployed involved. Remember the context of COVID and the Cuban response was so strict that you had a lot of people sitting around dealing with these exhausting cues, you know, and not really engaging in the ways that Cubans normally do through work and study. So what have they done? I mean, if you followed what's going on with Miguel Diaz-Canal, he spent the next few months every day in a different neighborhood shaking hat, you know, or bumping fists and, and bumping elbows with, with, you know, the people in the neighbors. And you know where he went first? The places where the most violent protests took place. And he has been up and down the country. So has um, Gerardo Hernandez, who many of you will know is one of the Cuban five, who was uh, facing two life sentences, but was released with the rapprochement with uh, Obama. And he is now the president of the Cuban streets uh, committees. He's been everywhere. And a lot of uh, time, energy and money is now being invested in those local communities. The UJC, the Union of Young Communists, the uh, Student Union, uh, University Student Federation, they're all revamping, rejuvenating their work and realizing that there are people in Cuba who have legitimate complaints. Their lives have become very difficult and very tough. And the Cuban leadership must engage and it must respond to their situation. But the way it responds is extremely limited because they are suffocated by the United States blockade. Um, that was uh, two of the, <laughs> three of the answers, three of the, the questions, right? That was like Cuba's response to COVID segued segued nicely into the 11th of July process and stuff about destabilization. And um, just to respond a bit about the, the fishermen and the law of value. If you carry on and watch the rest of the documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, um, Andy, have you? No, okay. So, you know, the points are clear and I'm in complete agreement. We cannot solve the climate crisis under the capitalist system. It, 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 and there you go, the law of value. The law of value demands that production is carried out for profit. Profit cannot contemplate the environment, right? To get, 
you know, this is how uh, capitalist countries are trying to tackle climate change without tackling, you know, without doing what those young people were demanding on those marches, system change. It's trying to turn the climate and environmental damage into what they call an externality, that you have to somehow put a price, make it part of the cost of production, but there are no legal enforcement mechanisms. And at the end of the day, if you're a big business or a small business, if you're a private business owner, what's your key motivation? It's profit. And if you don't make a profit, you will be swallowed up or sucked up or whatever the term is by your competitor because competition drives the, the race for profit through the law of value. <laughs> So um, we clearly cannot solve the environmental crisis under the capitalist system. We, um, we cannot reverse the damage that's been done under the capitalist system. And I know that's really scary to hear. Um, and, it, and it's much easier to think, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe COP26 can come up with some solution that everyone will sign up to. But you know what? It didn't. And it wouldn't. And it couldn't. You know, because um, the United States, biggest economy in the world, probably for the next two minutes until China takes over, it's not going to give up all of its advantages. It needs to keep exploiting the world's resources and populations to maintain the profit rate. That is what drives the system accumulation. And, you know, if you if you go to Marx and you read, you know, Marx and he's been well interpreted and in, in terms of the environmental issue by, you know, Bellamy Foster, US uh, academic and so on. Um, you, what is the source of, of value? It comes first from nature, but it's labor set to nature. So, you know, um, that's at the heart of it, exploiting our environment is at the heart of the profit motive. Socialism doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, societies will um, be good for the environment. We've seen disasters uh, in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries, and even in Cuba, they didn't take the issues as seriously. You know, there was pollution of rivers, and it's only really post nineties that the issue becomes top and center. So what you need is a, um, a state planned economy, which prioritizes the population, but understanding well that the population and the environment are inseparable. Okay, I'll stop there because I feel like I've been talking for ages. And Karen- Thank you for that great answer. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Um, and my question is, do you have any hope that the um, embargo can be lifted? And is there anything we can do to influence uh, that process? Um, are there any other questions? Come up. If you come right close, then I can probably hear you. explain about the doctors in another country helping on the COVID question. Um, I think it's really important uh, how Cuban internationalism may been done uh, actually before COVID, you know, helping the Ebola in Africa, you know, really. I think it's really important that uh, on the climate question also, I think it's really, it really shows the capacity the Cuban revolution they've been done, like Ellen explained. Um, I think it's really an example for the whole world, how you know, the revolution, because I think without revolution, we cannot, we cannot fight for climate. Um, so I think, I think it's important. So I'll just say a little comment. That's it. Thank you. Um, okay, shall I answer those now then, or does anyone want to add one in? Anybody? I'll take a, 
a question from the uh, Zoom. Anybody got a question? No, you see what happens is when people go on Zoom, they go into passive mode and they and they get shy. Come on, uh, it's one of you must have a question. Maybe we're just blown away by your comments, knowledge and personal experiences. OK, right. So can the I'm, I'm so grateful for this question because it, it's really what this is all about, you know. Knowledge is power, arm yourself, but then, you know, do something with it. I mean, what, what can the embargo be lifted? Under current conditions, the embargo can't be lifted. I'm sorry, but it's bad news. What does that mean for us? It means we have to change current conditions. We have to become active um, participants in conditions, right? So why did, um, you know, interesting question, why did Obama move towards rapprochement? Simple answer, the political cost of not changing policy towards Cuba was higher than the political cost of maintaining it. What do I mean? Well, for, for decades before that, every US president has said, Cuba's not that important to me. I'm going to, um, what's the word, just pass over control of Cuba policy to, uh, you know, the 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 Cuban exile uh, right-wing community, the, the politicians, right? And um, that's what they've done. Yeah, they're not really that bothered and they it's horse trading and you do that and we'll win Florida. And that's what it's all about, right? And in fact, there's some Cuban academics uh, who've written an article mapping, you know, how you can see how sanctions, new sanctions can be mapped on electoral cycles. Yeah, so, you know, attack Cuba if you want to win Florida and all the rest of it that helps you win the election. So, um, but what changed with Obama is that there was a swing in Latin America. There was what was called the pink tide. So you had more or less left-wing governments. So the, the very left-wing ones that declared they were building socialism were Venezuela, Nicaragua, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia. And then you had more sort of uh, social democratic ones or center, uh, center left you know, you had Chile, Brazil, with Lula, um, and a few others, uh, Panama, Uruguay at one point. So, but what happened was when Obama, well, Obama took office in January 2009, and he had his first meeting with the Latin American heads of state, the Summer of the Americas, four months into his mandate. And he went along saying, you know, new, new chapter, new, new set of relations, fresh start for relations with Latin America. And he was apparently astonished because those heads of state said, no fresh start while you have this antiquated policy on Cuba, right? And, um, you know, we can't, we can't ca start a new chapter unless you invite Cuba into the summit of the Americas, right? Cuba had been expelled from the Organization of American States. So um, this starts to put pressure on Obama. Then you have this Alan Gross affair. So, you know, that progress was going to be made. It had to be halted because there was a US citizen in prison. But he goes back, Obama goes back in 2012 for another summit of the Americas. And this time, even the, the heads of state of right-wing countries, like Colombia, like Panama at that time, were saying to him, uh-uh, you have to change your Cuba policy or we're not coming. The Alba country said, we're not coming to another summit of the Americas. It won't happen unless Cuba's invited. So Obama realized that the political cost of not changing Cuba policy was higher than the political costs of maintaining it because those um, Cuba and American, the you know, right-wing politicians were losing leverage. The demographic has changed in Florida. Um, you know, Obama won without the Cuban vote and all the rest of it. So that was the scenario then. Now, it's not by coincidence that there has been a set of circumstances, they call them constitutional coups, and outright coups that have cleared that pink tide, the left governments away and replaced them with right wing neoliberal governments. That seems to be swinging back to the left now. So there is an interesting dynamic in Latin America. But the point is, if that is no longer the point of pressure, there needs to be another point of pressure 
so that the Biden administration feels that the political cost of not changing its policy on Cuba is too high. Now, where will that pressure come from? If it's not from the Latin American heads of state, which it's not at the moment, it has to come from a movement within inside the United States. So Karen, was it you? I think you asked, can the embargo be lifted? It's not gonna be lifted currently, but what can we do? Well, basically we have to make sure that there is a higher political cost for Biden and his administration and whoever else comes after him for leaving the embargo than there is um, a higher cost for leaving it than there is for, for um, getting rid of it. So, you know, it, it's a massive responsibility, but you are the citizens or residents in the country which is the embargo. This is not like the embargo on other countries. The, the sanctions on Cuba are entirely unilateral. I'll tell you more than that. Not, what, what I mean by unilateral is it's only the United States that sanctions Cuba. Not only that, Britain, the EU, Canada, and many other countries actually have laws making it illegal to implement US sanctions against their citizens and entities, right? Britain has a law, like I am constantly subject to US sanctions. And if my government and legal system, if the political and legal system was actually implementing the legislation that we have, then, you know, companies would be fined for saying that I can't, you know, send money to Cuba or, or whatever it is that I want to do, yeah, for taking money um, away from uh, fundraising campaigns, all these things that have happened. So we really need a big movement in the United States to demand an end to the US blockade. And, you know, the shape and form that that takes, I don't know, it will start with a small meeting like this one in person in Albany, but it needs to be built and it needs to be built very quickly because Cuba is really suffocated right now. I don't know if any of you know this, but on top of all of the problems that it's had with the Trump sanctions, which by the way, 243 new sanctions, actions and coercive measures introduced on top of a blockade based on six legal statutes that has been in place for six decades. At the point when you know most of us thought, what else can they do? They found 243 new action sanctions and measures to take to make life harder for Cuba, to make it more difficult to engage with, uh, to get access to international finance, trade, investment, market, equipment, you know, even medical ventilators the Cubans couldn't get in the context of a pandemic because of sanctions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the situation was, was terrible before. It got much worse with COVID because the Cubans lost 70% of their revenue from tourism just in 2020. You know, if you're not getting money in, you can't buy stuff, right? So they were only, they only bought 60% of what they were planning to buy. So the shops are empty, there's queues. And I mean, the situation is really bad. And then listen to this, the sanctions that have been announced against Russia, the, uh, um, what's his name, Juan Rodriguez, who's Biden's national, national security advisor for the Western Hemisphere, has boasted that they are designed to impact Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. So just when you think things can't get more difficult for Cuba, now they have a set of sanctions against Russia that will um, indirectly and directly impact uh, Cuba and their ability to just, just subsist. So, you know, the need to build a movement is really urgent because, you know, I don't, we don't know how long Cuba can hang on for. Um, what would we do without a Cuba to look at? And, and as, as you said, the speaker there sitting at the back, you know, it's so important what Cuba, Cuba's development model and its approach, you called it an example to the world. I agree with you. And let me talk about now this nice segue into Cuban medical internationalism. Um, I don't know whether you've got any copies of my book there to sell, but there's a whole chapter on Cuban medical internationalism. And you're quite right. It started well before COVID. It started in 1960. 
1959, you have the Cuban Revolution. You have 6,200 medics, physicians in Cuba, private. Um, and what happens very early, more or less within the first couple of years, half of them leave. So you definitely don't have enough doctors for the Cuban people. And yet in Chile in um, 1960, the year after, there's a terrible earthquake, yeah, a deadly earthquake. And the Cubans send doctors. They send doctors they can't spare, but they send them anyway, because that has always been the principle of Cuban internationalism. We share what we have, not what we have left over. So the Cubans went in response to that. That was one of their forms of medical internationalism, responding to an emergency situation. You mentioned Ebola and the same with COVID-19. So Ebola, the Cubans sent the biggest delegation for the longest amount of time. There's a there's an interview in the book. I For the book, I interviewed um, uh, a guy, the guy who prepared the Cuban medics who went to combat Ebola. They'd never even had a case of Ebola in Cuba because they've eliminated, uh, you know, so many diseases and viruses and so on. And he said, we, we went to the World Health Organization. They were, you know, pretty much begging for help. All around the world, they were throwing money at them. And they said, we don't need money. We need doctors, compassionate doctors who know how to deal with this disease. So he flew over to Geneva and he said, um, we're going, we're gonna send this many doctors, 250 something, and we're gonna stay for six months. And they said, you're mad, you can't stay for six months, you'll all catch Ebola and die. He said, no, we won't, we'll prepare. And so they went 250, they stayed six months, not uh, one, one Cuban medic got Ebola and he survived. One, you know what he did? He got taken to the hospital in Geneva and in his fever, his Ebola fever, he said to this guy that I interviewed, um, Jorge Perez, who was the director of the Hospital of Tropical Diseases. He said, when I'm better, I'm going back. And he did. He recovered in the hospital and back he went to, to where he just you know, caught Ebola. And um, yeah, I mean, just incredible. Two, two Cuban doctors actually died of malaria. I mean, isn't it incredible when COVID started and they were talking about the numbers that had died and it, you know, it was alarming, but then it, you had to compare it with the fact that 400,000 people die in Africa every year from malaria. And, you know, nothing is done about it. Very little money goes into research. So, yes, yeah, so the, the Cubans have a med form of medical internationalism, which is responding to emergencies. They have something you'll have heard of, lots of you, the Henry Reeve International Medical Brigade, which was set up actually to respond to Hurricane Katrina in, what was that, 2004, 2005? And uh, of course, the Bush administration didn't recognize or accept their offer of assistance but very soon they were in Kashmir where there was a terrible earthquake and then Bolivia Guatemala and you know there's no shortage of disasters but the second form of medical internationalism was first developed in 1963 and that is in the newly independent Algerian state so the Cubans had supported the Algerian struggle for independence they'd sent soldiers but they had also brought back to Cuba injured soldiers and children, orphans, to give them medical treatment. So that, that was another form of Cuban medical internationalism to get patients, foreign patients, into Cuba to give them treatment. Then you have the form after Algeria becomes independent, where they go to Algeria and they send 50 medics, 53 nurses and doctors, to help them set up a public healthcare system. And that they have subsequently done all over Africa before, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, well before they started in Venezuela, which most people know about the, the um, Oil for Doctors program. So, you know, 2004, they, the Venezuelans said, we need some help with, with medics. By the end of the year, that was April, by the end of the year, they'd sent 10,000 Cuban doctors. Where did they go? They went to the poorest neighborhoods where people had never seen a doctor. They'd never seen a doctor because you had to pay. Now, the Chavez government had asked 
the, Q, the Venezuelan doctors, can you go into these communities to treat these patients? They said, no, we're private practice. We're not going into those conditions, but the Cubans did because the Cubans actually have a system of medical training that prepares them for the worst possible conditions, for giving diagnostics in the field where there is no electricity, no complex equipment. Apparently, when they train these the students, they say, how would you deal with this in the Amazon? You know, in the worst possible, the most austere conditions, how would you diagnose this and deal with this, this ailment? So the Cubans went to Venezuela. What happened? They got to Venezuela. Uh, they also sent educators to Venezuela. And then they said, hold on, we have a problem. We're trying to teach people to read and write. And they have a fantastic program for doing so. It's called Yo Si Puedo, Yes I Can. But people can't learn, why? Because we have thousands of people with easily reversible blindness, cataracts, glaucoma. What do they do? Send them to Cuba, get a five minute operation, completely free, stay in a hospital for a week to recover, then back they go. So, you know, this program then extends and they say, well, we don't need to send them to Cuba. We can set up the hospitals and train or ophthalmological specialists in, the, in, in Venezuela. Then they do the same in Bolivia, Venezuela. Something like 10 million people have had their eyesight restored through this Cuban-Venezuelan program called Operacion Milagro, uh, Operation Miracle. But you know, who's ever heard of this in the mainstream media? Who has ever heard of it? It's crazy. Like their medical internationalism is phenomenal. The the um you know there's obviously a lot of a lot of attention being paid to Ukraine at the moment. How many of you know that the Cubans had a program to assist mainly children from Ukraine called the Children of Chernobyl program? Over twenty three years, they treated twenty six thousand people mainly from Ukraine, also Russia and Belarus, who'd been affected by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, who were suffering from cancer, different kinds of cancers. And they took them to Cuba and they gave them, some of them just needed rest and recuperation. Some of them needed quite serious medical treatment. And they didn't, those patients didn't pay a penny. And the Ukrainian government didn't pay a penny. The Cubans paid for all of it. And they did so during their special period of economic crisis in the 1990s. So, yeah, I mean, you know, Cuban medical internationalism, I've written one chapter, you could write, to be honest, you could write a whole book about each one of those missions and, um, and projects that they've carried out. And it's, it's criminal that it's not known about widely. It's criminal, but it's not a coincidence and it's not an accident it's because it is a threat to the very system of privatized commodified healthcare that is so uh, exemplified by the united states i think i've answered those questions <laughs> Uh, as you noted, in, in 60 years, and by every administration running the United States government. But I don't think it's because it was a lesser issue that they left to Cuban exiles in Miami. Uh, that may have been a, a factor in the US political scene, but that's, I think it's, it's better understood to say that every administration running the US capitalist government has agreed with this policy. They think it's important and they all agree that this Cuban revolution should be throttled, should be strangled. Why do they all agree? I think we've, I think we've made a case for it in your, in your excellent presentation. Uh, but um, it helps you understand what's happening today. Uh, Obama made openings, yes, but isn't it better understood that he was looking for a different way to strangle the Cuban revolution? Then Trump imposed 
more strict uh, uh, policies that did worsen the situation. But here we are uh, with a year and a half of a democratic administration that is continuing those things. It has not changed. So again, my case is, uh, my argument is that they all agree on doing this. Now, um, Cuba's part of the world and their strength comes from being part of the struggles of the world. We've seen uh, high points, like when the revolution in Nicaragua, struggle in El Salvador, Grenadian revolution was about, those past. But today is a world of great struggle. Um, including inside the United States. And this is where we'll find new supporters of the revolution and new voices against the embargo. And uh, it was also 60 years ago that Fidel Castro made the point that there will be a victorious revolution in the United States before there's a victorious counter-revolution inside Cuba. <laughs> It's a good point. Even 60 years later, there's a lot to hang your hat on, on that. There's great struggle in the world today, including inside this country. Uh, it's not dominated by um, bitter exiles from Cuba and Miami, because in fact, one of the great things we were part of that got us out of our hiding holes in the uh, pandemic here was the Cuba car caravan had their uh, real uh, base in Miami. So, you know, it's not that these uh, bitter old men who uh, wish they could get their plantations back uh, have much power in US politics. They actually don't. But um, we, have, we have new fighters out there who will love to hear that uh, another world is possible. Isn't this what Cuba gives to us? So it's that connection that I think can give us hope. Any other questions? It's moving up on nine o'clock. So and it's, I know it's late in Scotland, so. Moving up on 1 a.m. <laughs> <clears throat> any, other, any other questions from the Zoom? attendees. Last chance. Hello? Anybody? Well, thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, Ellen. Wow. Thank you. And this program has been saved, will be saved and put on YouTube shortly. So keep an eye out for that. John, can I ask? She knows. Thank you, Helen. That was really enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you. But there's someone asking a question. Yep. And her documentaries go on cable, and we put them on cable TV. Are they copyrighted? Is there a problem? Can we get permission? I think it should be fine. We um, dealt, unlike last time, we dealt with all the licenses um, so that they're broadcastable. But we can, you can contact me and we can check. Because we will check the licenses according to what's being proposed. Okay, and you'll get that message to somebody because cable TV would be a different audience than targeted people looking at YouTube. And I would love to get it up on our local uh, cable. Uh, shows because I I think people would be interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's due to be broadcast soon on Free Speech TV. I don't know if you know that channel. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you were wonderful. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much, John. Yep. Good night. Good night.